Um, so now we're going to uh, meet with Simon. So I'm really delighted to introduce Simon to you. Obviously, we know him, those of us in our congregation, we know him from Holy Trinity, but um, he and Anne have been a mem members of our congregation, I think almost as long or maybe a bit longer than John and I, which is about 12 years, something like that, Simon. Um, but he wears lightly his prestige as a top scientist in species conservation. Significantly, he's been a key compiler of the IUCN Red List of Threatened Species. And last year, he won the prestigious International Blue Planet Prize in recognition of his contribution to resolving global environmental problems. Welcome, Simon. We are very grateful for you giving us your time. And um, we look forward to your presentation now with some slides, and then you and I are going to have a brief discussion subsequently. Thank you, um, Carolyn. Okay, hopefully you can see that. Um, just some very brief slides from me. Uh, so, so Caroline's asked me to, um, as a scientist who works in conservation, to give you um, a very, very short and high level overview um, of, um, well, it's my understanding, but it comes from a number of people of, of what, what is the, the state of the biosphere of creation of the world at the moment. And basically, we have a gl growing global economy and we have a growing human population and that has put stresses on the system. And those stresses are basically um, huge demand for energy, huge demand for water, huge demand for food, an enormous creation of infrastructure, housing, roads, cities, and a huge amount of waste and pollution we create. So the five things that we do, and they are driving essentially what we call three global crises. Um, one is climate change. One is the increasing wealth and poverty, so inequity um, globally. And the other is what uh, technically we call biodiversity loss, the loss of nature. And so we often tend to think of these things as separate, biodiversity loss, separate from poverty, separate from climate change, but actually they all stem from a similar set of unsustainable demands we're putting on the planet. Can I go to the next slide, um, John? And um, that's it, unfortunately. So those three crises, but unfortunately is worse than that because these crises unfortunately affect each other. So climate change drives poverty, poverty drives biodiversity loss, biodiversity loss drives climate change, and we go round in a spiral and they drive each other down. So not only do we have these big drivers of unsustainability caused by the way we live, but then the crises we create then exacerbate each other and we have this downward spiral. Can we go to the next slide? So what we then end up with is, is this sort of summary. This is a summary that the global policymakers often use. So um, it's called a state pressure response. Some of you might have come across this in other, other um, contexts. So state is like the state of nature. The state of nature is, you see the red line going down, the left-hand graph is getting worse. There's the pressure, all the threats, how we live our demands on the planet, and you can see the pressure is going up even faster. So it's a relentless increase. And then we have the response that could be our conservation action. It could be improved policies, um, uh, could be changes in agricultural subsidies, whatever. Our response to the, to the um, declining state of nature is unfortunately tending to level off. It has increased over time, but it's not keeping pace with the increased pressures. And that causes state to continue to go down. So that is a sort of summary of where we're at. However, uh, lest we all feel massively depressed, we should go to the next slide. Um, it is a bad situation. Now, this is some work I did with some colleagues a few years ago. This is called the Red List Index. Um, so the Red List is the global list of threatened species that IUCN, the organization I worked with, for over 30 years runs on behalf of the world. 
And the red list index shows the trends in the extinction risk of species over time. So we did this for ungulates, ungulates like cows and wild cattle, wild sheep, wild goats, deer, pigs, things like this. And between 1996 and 2008, that black line shows you what happened to the red list index over that 12 year period, it went down. That's not good, right? Um, but then we did a thought experiment and our thought experiment, we said, supposing we had stopped all conservation, all our efforts in 1996, what would have happened? In other words, we're trying to measure what was the impact of the conservation we actually did. So next slide. And that's it um, in the scientific jargon, it's called the counterfactual. So this is what would have happened if we stopped conservation. And you can see the line goes down massively faster. So in a 12 year period, the state of the world's ungulates would have been massively worse than actually it was. So we weren't doing well enough. It was deteriorating, but the conservation we actually did stopped it being much worse. So, so actually the amount of money, the total global effort on conservation was not that great, but it had a very, very significant impact. And so the take home message I want you to have from this is we're not doing enough, but what we do do can be surprisingly effective. And, um, and uh, so just at a purely human level, uh, we're able to do much more than sometimes we realize. There you are, that's my very quick <coughs> summary of the state of the planet. And uh, I'm passing back to you, uh, Carolyn. Thank you, Simon. That's very tantalizing and um, both uh, a challenge and also an encouragement to us, thank you. So. Um, when we were discussing together uh, how we would conduct our chat today, I quoted something that I found in one of the books I've been reading, and I'm going to read it now. If we are to care well for the earth, we need scientists to help us understand the thing for which we are called to care, and we need artists to help us see this world anew. And it is really helpful to have you as a scientist helping us to understand the world for which we care and to give us some parameters within which we can operate. But I want to ask you personally, what does caring for the earth mean for you as a scientist? Uh, thanks, Carolyn. Um, so by being, being a scientist, and I know I'm not the only one on this call, being a scientist is a great privilege because you get to understand lots of things or, or begin to understand them, I think it might be better. So I think science can give us um, a sense of wonder because we can uh, learn and discover the things that are even more extraordinary than we first realize in our first perception of nature. So we, we learn the extraordinary diversity of nature, it tells you something of God that it's so diverse. People often ask me, how many species are there in the world? Well, we don't know. It's between five and 100 million. So, um, so it, the diversity is extraordinary. But then within that, there are incredible adaptations, uh, pollinators designed to pollinate a particular type of flower, for example. Or we look at how species migrate and their migrations are synchronized to match food supply. Um, or we look at all the huge diversity of coral reefs and science gives us a sense of wonder. Science also makes us better informed, so we understand something. So for instance, through my study of, of science, I realized that hydropower, taking river from uh, energy from rivers, is not a green energy. It does huge damage. Um, we can realize that moving species outside their range does huge da damage. We can understand the huge changes taking place in the oceans. These are all things I learned from science. I have to say though that science isn't the only discipline we need to achieve conservation. It, it gives us evidence, just like we've used scientific evidence to conquer the pandemic, but we need much more. We need love, we need passion, we need lawyers, we need all sorts of things. I'd say science is critical for achieving conservation, but it's not the only thing. No, and, and theology comes into it. That's why we are meeting together with these Bible studies. So uh, we're, we're about to look at quite a tricky passage in Romans. And uh, 
Paul talks about creation being liberated from its bondage to decay. And I wondered what you would say, what you make of those words. It's a bit like that, um, the um, Colossians passage we just read about Christ or God in Christ reconciling all things to himself. I think that's a similar thought. Um, hard to understand precisely how it will happen, but surely these are passages of enormous hope, aren't they? That Christ's saving purposes aren't just about us as a people, it's about creation as a whole. And so um, we can honor Christ by caring for what he's made because it matters to him. And um, so actually later on in that um, Carmody Gray interview, she talks about how what we think about something hugely Im impacts how we treat it. So if we really think that creation matters to God, then we think very differently about it. And if we think it's only for our benefit. So um, those are the, so the th sorts of thoughts that I have from that. But I, I guess I find those passages as massively hopeful and encouraging without understanding, understanding the uh, precise details. I'm not certain that anyone does. No, I think, I think you're right. I think uh, we need to have humility uh, mm. as we come to scripture, as well as a keen desire to try and hear what God is saying to us. So finally, Simon, I'm going to ask you what your word of advice would be to us as a congregation. We're trying to do the right thing. What sort of, what sort of advice might you give us? Well, I've been thinking about this, Carolyn, and all sorts of things. Uh, perhaps I'm going to start with an unconventional one, is lament. I'm not very good at lamenting, but I'm reading this book by, uh, edited book by Hannah Malcolm at the moment, Words for a Dying World, and it's about lament, and it's stories from all over the world. I was reading it yesterday, actually, while at the same time listening to the Verdi Requiem. Uh, I hadn't intended to do it that way, but it was quite powerful when you do it, and I think we have to lament um, what we've done if we're to, if to really get to a place to understand uh, what we must do and what it means to God. But jumping on, we also shouldn't be stuck in, in sorrow. We have to move forward and we have to worship um, because creation and worship are not really separable. Uh, you know, the trees of the field clap their hands in Isaiah 55. There's a sense in which we exist, our special role made in God's image is to voice creation's praise and the creation itself points us to God it's grander grandeur it's detail it's beauty so I start with those perhaps more theological points first of all and then perhaps go to things that may or may not be more practical there's the whole lifestyle stuff how we live I pointed out those five things at the beginning our demand for food energy water um, etc how we live we're understanding more and more has impact. Now, decisions we take about what we buy in supermarkets are very complex and we won't all agree on the right things, but we do have to um, really consider our lifestyles. And uh, um, I'm very, very early on in this um, game. And so I'm a learner. Um, there's a local stuff we can do. Um, Anne spoke last week on the, our gardens and what we do with that. Um, and um, uh, our Russia, um, uh, which I'm privileged to be uh, leading at the moment, is all about trying to work where, um, where we're at. And we've got many people here in the church and Peter Harris is of course with us now, many others who can help us think about how we live this out now. There's our giving, there are many things we can give to, um, both Christian and secular organizations, for example. I can advise anyone who wants to know about that. We could join various organizations, our memberships, and then there's our political influence. And uh, just in case you're um, wondering, I would say in this country, every single political party falls short on this. And so what, whether you feel a more left-wing, right-wing sort of person, there's work you can do in the party you might be, feel attracted to. And so I'm not so much saying go one side to the other, I'm saying try and embed creation care um, in, in the way you try and influence political trends. That's a really very quick and superficial summary, but I hope it helps, Carolyn. 
Not at all superficial. And thank you very, very much, Simon. I know we'll be returning to some of those points, particularly next time uh, when we meet, because we're going to be looking at some of this practical outworking.